What do you get when you take the Walt Disney Animation Studios of the late 80s and cross it with a Charles Dickens classic? Well, you get Oliver and Company, of course, and we're going to discuss this in depth coming up. Hey animation fans, Animator Talk here to celebrate the art of animation and its contribution to entertainment of yesterday, today, and into the future. This disney version of Oliver Twist was retold through Talking Dogs and a cat in the lead role. In an effort to regroup after the failure that was The Black Cauldron, a box office flop that was pulled from the theaters after only two weeks of release, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg held a story meeting to go over the next film already in production, Basil of Baker Street. Uh, now we know it today as The Great Mouse Detective. They would later hold a story pitch meeting to see what films to greenlight next. Some story ideas given were of an updated retelling of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, and a new spin on Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, but in space. But it wasn't until storyman Pete Young pitched his idea that Jeffrey Katzenberg sat up. It was Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, told through dogs and kittens in the lead roles. Now, Jeffrey was attempting to remake Oliver back at Paramount, but he met much resistance. He immediately greenlit the idea of Oliver, calling it Oliver and the Dodger. George Scribner was positioned as the director, and the story team began their journey taking a literary classic and transcribing it to animal characters in the modern New York City. They would leave characters like Fagin and Sykes human, as well as a kind little girl, Jenny, who would take Oliver in and show him a better way of life on Fifth Avenue. Now, hijinks ensue when Dodger and the gang mistake the situation and go on a rescue mission to retrieve Oliver. The animators were ready to get started, though the attitude was this was just another talking dog and cat movie. Character design was handled by Glenn Keane, Mike Gabriel, and Andreas Deja before he had to relocate to England to animate on Roger Rabbit. Supervising animation of Oliver and Dodger were assigned to Mark Henn, while Sykes, Jenny, Georgette, and Fagin were all assigned to the great Glenn Keane. While Mike Gabriel animated Tito, Ruben Aquino was tasked to fill in the rest of the dog gang. Hoping a star-fueled cast would increase ticket sales, Jeffrey Katzenberg would cast young talent Joey Lawrence in the title role. Why did you guys take me away? Dom DeLuise would play Fagin. Let me down. What do you got? Let's see what you got. <sighs> and the cast of dogs would be played by names like Bette Midler. Get away from me, you little bug-eyed creep. Cheech Marin. Hey man, if this is torture, chain me to the wall. Richard Mulligan. I love a story with food in it. And an inspired bit of casting with Billy Joel as the Eiffel Dodger. Hey, keep it down, guys. The game's on. Joel was cast for a street smart Bronx accent and to sing the hit song, Why Should I Worry, while leading Oliver through the city of New York. Now, speaking of music, this soundtrack was packed with talent. It also starred Huey Lewis, who would sing the film opener, Once Upon a Time in New York City, which was written by Howard Ashman. Once upon a time in New York City. Perfect Isn't Easy was performed by Bette Midler's character, George Adam. And Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters provided the singing voice of Rita in the song Streets of Gold, where the gang would show Oliver what is expected of a pickpocket in New York City. Now, I loved this soundtrack as a kid. As a matter of fact, I wore out my cassette tape in my boombox before replacing it years later with my current copy on CD. Now, for realism and animation efficiency, Computer animation was used on many of the vehicles in the film, whether they're the many taxi cabs on the street, the moving trucks, or even the cement mixer, Fagin's scooter, as well as the train in the climax of the film. Now, the preceding film, The Great Mouse Detective, was the first to use this computer animation system for the gears inside the London Tower. This film would use this technology to great effect, 
while maintaining the linear quality of the animation cells so as to not distract from the film's aesthetic. While the studio would animate many vehicles and features past, the amount of vehicles needed to populate the streets of Manhattan would have proven impossible without the aid of this new computer system. Oliver and Company was released on November 18, 1988. As luck would have it, John Bluth's animation studio released The Land Before Time on the same day through Universal. It's rare to see two animated films release on the same day, I think Bluth and Universal Studios were trying something out there. Land Before Time would beat out Oliver at the box office on opening weekend. However, Oliver would end up earning far more during its overall release. Looking at this film today, it's nearly impossible not to notice how dated this film is. From the breakdancer in the sweatpants and high tops grooving to his boombox on his shoulder, to the women dressed in their big shoulder padded dresses, it rightly dates the film back to 1988 without question. The film also gave a lot of free advertising to companies like Coca-Cola, Rider Rental Trucks, USA Today, Kodak, Tab Soda, just to name a few. Now today's Hollywood would cross promote this movie to death. The background painters merely added these companies in to add a little more realism to an very ad-saturated area like Manhattan, where it's set. Now, noting my love for this film isn't without its flaws. While the primary and secondary characters are very well received, the tertiary characters fall very flat. Some sloppy animation can be seen here or there. Sometimes rough animation isn't cleaned up before the Xerox processing, while some characters, like Louis the hot dog vendor, seems to float or slide along the sidewalks. Come on, get out of there and shoot. Get out of here. Come on. But those issues are so minor that I easily overlook them just as soon as Dodger enters the scene with his syncopated rhythms entering into the film's score. <laughs> Christmas of 1988. The t-shirts, the stuffed animals, the storybooks on tape were nothing next to the McDonald's cross promotion with the Happy Meal toys. Yep, you could get a Happy Meal toy of a finger puppet of Oliver or Dodger. And if your mother was as cool as mine, she would buy gift certificates that she didn't need just so you could get a special Dodger musical Christmas ornament that still adorns my Christmas tree to today. Hey, Dodge, we make beautiful music together. Yeah, kid. Your holiday place, McDonald's. Oliver was a triumph for Walt Disney feature animation. Now, it wasn't a blockbuster by any means. It brought in a little over $74 million with a budget of 31. But it did begin the momentum that would build into the new renaissance at the studio. Now, the film would go on to earn a Golden Globe for Best Original Song. And with its comedic script, modern setting, and a pop-loaded soundtrack, it made it cool for teenagers to see a Disney film again. Oh, hey, did you know? Check it out! Oliver and Company was released on November 18, 1988. Does that date sound familiar to you? It is the same date Steamboat Willie was released in 1928 which makes that date Mickey Mouse's official birthday. As a matter of fact, that particular date was the beginning of a year-long celebration of Mickey's 60th year. In 2001, studios were clamoring to remove footage, including the Twin Towers in all of their films, out of reverence for those suffering after the tragic events of 9-11. Disney decided not to touch this film, as removing the towers would come at a great cost and affect the finished product. Fans and critics would later applaud Disney for this decision, as many feel the footage is a nice remembrance of what New York used to be like before the attack. Oliver wasn't named in the film until the second act. Sure, Huey Lewis would reference the cat by name in the opening song, but he was only referred to as a cat until Jenny takes him home. Disney artists love to reference other films in their animation. Did you know you can find other Disney characters within Oliver and Company? 
That's right, while Dodger is singing in the streets of New York, we see him leading dogs down the boulevard, almost like the Pied Piper. If you look at these crowds carefully, you can find characters from Lady and the Tramp and 101 Dalmatians. Georgette has a gentleman caller who gives away her persona. If you take a close look at the framed pictures on her vanity, you'll notice a framed picture of Radigan from The Great Mouse Detective. I guess he's a big fan of Georgette. I'm glad at least someone is. To gain a dog's eye view perspective for this film, the layout team would take a camera and film things from about two feet off the ground. I was 11 years old in the Christmas season of 1988. Huey Lewis and the News was my favorite band. My other favorite singer was none other than the piano man himself, Billy Joel. Times haven't changed. So you can imagine how excited I was to go to the theater and see a Disney film that had both singing on the soundtrack. I settled into my seat with a box of sweet tarts in one hand and a cup of Coke in the other, eyes wide for that old blue Disney logo animating across the screen, just before Huey Lewis belts out the song Once Upon a Time in New York City. Man, so good. The song and the animation sequences set the scene of a very dated 1980s New York City and an orphan kitten who's desperate to find a family to take him in from the dangers of a busy city. I was one happy redhead. I want to thank you for joining me today. I urge you give Oliver and Company another viewing and take it all in. Please leave a comment on your favorite memories of Oliver and Company. Did you see it in the first run? Or did you see it in the re-release at the theaters? Until next time, keep moving forward.